Hey guys, this is Jeroen, better known as Dutch Bond fan, and yesterday I finally got to see No Time To Die. After a six year wait, I could not be happier to have finally watched this movie, and uh, sorry for everyone that still has to wait. Uh, I'm especially looking at my friends uh, down under uh, and all the countries that don't have No Time To Die as of yet. Uh, I really feel your pain. Um, I share your pain kind of as well. I was going to initially see this movie in London. Uh, I had this whole trip planned uh, for years. I had my plane tickets ready, uh, but due to quarantine restrictions and COVID related stuff, for me the trip was off. So that is what it is. Um, now instead of, you know, pondering about it and feeling down, I made the best possible plans here in the Netherlands and went to the biggest cinema in Amsterdam instead, which is an hour and a half drive from where I live. Uh, but it was totally worth it to see it in that theater there. Uh, me and Leerit had the best seats, VIP seats. We had perfect sound quality. It was a beautiful theater. What an experience to watch a Bond movie there for the first time. So I could not be happier to have experienced it in this way, which for me was the, the best alternative to London possible for this year. Hopefully next time I will join in with the Bond community and watch it with everyone else and I would absolutely dream to experience the Royal Albert Hall myself one day like my friend David Saritsky, Kelvin Dyson, Tom Sears and Chris Wright from James Bond Radio all the people from the Bond community that I love to talk to that I consider at least friends within the Bond community um, I'm so happy for all the guys that did uh, went there and I can only hope to one day share that with all of you guys as well. So this is the actual spoiler laden review so if you haven't seen the movie yet please check out my spoiler free video uh, and please click away this video because I'm about to reveal major things about the movie you have been warned so Please refrain from watching the rest of the movie if you don't want any of this spoiled to you. So, um, without further ado, we're going to be starting uh, a very large review, I think, because there is just so much to talk about with No Time To Die. So much stuff. Now, I want to immediately address the elephant in the room here, the, the ending of the movie. I normally want to start at the beginning and just talk my way through. Um, but with this initial reaction, I just want to immediately go to the ending because all the messages I'm getting right now is DBF, what do you think of the ending? What did you think of the ending? I received emails, uh, DMs, personal messages on Facebook and you all want to know that one. This, to me, is a major one. Um, and I really had a feeling this was coming because I've been discussing this ending uh, throughout, we all have, you know, we all kind of felt, is this coming or not? Are they going to go there? I've been discussing this with, with John of Haphazard Stuff in multiple of our uh, videos that we did in our forecasting series. I also discussed this with David Saritsky uh, in a video we did over a year ago. Um, so there was always this feeling. Um, but I was never certain if they had the balls to do it. Uh, but seeing the hashtag no time, to, no time for spoilers everywhere, I felt like, yeah, they might be going there. Unfortunately, not everybody took the hashtag too serious. And I just want to say to the guy that spoiled this to me, hours on the actual day of the release, hours before my screening, that was uncool. That really was uncool. I didn't take it serious. I still needed to see it with my own eyes, but still, doing doing this, it's just not cool. So please, to everyone that that has seen the movie, don't do this to people because it's just ugly. Anyway, Bond dies. It happened. They killed him off. And I don't know how to feel about it yet. It's so... You know, we felt like, are they going to do it? And I've only had one night to let this sink in. I definitely need to watch this more often. But I have been thinking, how else were they going to end this movie? 
Were they gonna bring Bond back to the servers again? They did that a lot, like the ending of Skyfall was similar, the ending of Quantum, I never left, you know, I, I'm back. So that's been done before. Are they going to let him go away again with Madeline into the sunset? That's the ending of the previous movie, that's been done before. Or are they going to just have him sleep with a woman like the first 20 movies? I wish, but it's kind of not the thing anymore in these times. So I think, you know, being seeing as this is the, the last movie of the Craig movies, I guess this was the only way to go. Um, and it certainly hit me, like, they did do this. And I'm still divided on the way that they killed Bond. Because it was a very heroic moment, but it also was kind of harsh, wasn't it? Like the guy's emotionally laden about Vesper, about Madeline. He, he finally got to have his second chance. He got a child. Another thing we need to talk about in this review. He, he actually is a father now. There's so much to process. That, that's the thing. He has a child, he, he, he has a second chance with Madeline. The guy gets poisoned and gets bombed to death by ballistic missiles. This is harsh. It really, really got me like, this is emotional, it's well filmed, it's cool. It, it really hits you and you know, but was this the way to do it? Um, I will get back to that when I get to my actual recapping of this movie after seeing it more and letting this pro process but as of now I walked out of the cinema with so much thoughts Bond is dead that was in my mind so much I actually sat around to the end credits just to check if the James Bond will return is there so much people got up left their seats and I was sitting there, I told Leerit, we need to sit down, why? There's always James Bond will return, I need to see if it's there. And it was there, for those who didn't know. Um, and I said, I was, and went like, yes, I told you! And then some people that were still in front of me, they went like, huh? Oh! So they had no clue to wait for that. Then you, you could definitely see the diehard fans were remained, remained seated. And all the others immediately got up as soon as the, the credits came up. Um, by the way, using Louis Armstrong's uh, All the Time in the World and all the references to Majesties, that was cool. This was the, the, credit, the end credit song they should have used for Majesties, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so they really, really hit the homages for um, Bond fans who, who are the only ones that actually know it's referencing on a Majesty Secret Service. All the casual fans, they, they have no clue and, and that's what I always like about the Bond movies. This this was another, there was so much fan service in this. But let me know in the comments. Um, this video is a spoiler video so I guess here it's safe. So I warned everybody to come here but I'm so curious how you guys feel about about this whole thing. Um, I, I dig it. But I'm not necessarily on board with it yet in the way that I did it, so to speak. I do get, you know, they can reboot after this anyway, so it doesn't matter. But it's Bond, and to me, this is the big argument for me, Bond is normally the embodiment of survival. And now, Safin essentially won. Blofeld and Safin, they, they wanted to make Bond suffer. Bond and Madeline needed to suffer and they succeeded in that. Madeline is now a mother with one child without Bond and Bond isn't there anymore. They, it's, I don't know, it's just, I'm still divided. That's, that's my opinion as of now. Um, I wasn't necessarily fuming or mad like, oh, they went there. I was kind of understanding as well because what else were you gonna do? I'm just questioning the way that they did it. This also has me wondering if um, Danny Boyle parted with the franchise because he didn't want to kill off Bond but then Fukunaga came aboard and he did want to go with it because I think that was the creative difference they were talking about uh, which I guess maybe will 
pop up soon. Maybe Danny Boyle will speak up now that the movie is released and tell us, like, yeah, I didn't want to kill Bond off. That's the reason. So, um, who knows what kind of movie this would have turned out to be had he directed. But there's a lot more to talk about and let's rewind a little bit to the beginning. The actual beginning. The gun barrel of this movie. I, first of all, I was so happy there was a gun barrel. I, I told Lirid, like, ah, oh, there needs to be a gun barrel. I hope they didn't get rid of it again. I, I, I did hear the score of Hans Zimmer beforehand, so that really gave me a cue, like, there needs to be one. Then the gun barrel came in. And again, they did not went with a traditional one. There's a big circle first that goes the other way, and then the small circles pop in. The gun barrel is all silver now, almost like an ice color. And there's no blood, which to me is like, okay, this is different. And it fades into a really cool shot in the snow. Um, I didn't hate it, but Craig never really got a normal gun barrel, did he? Never really had one. It's always different, but this is another different one. Um, I don't hate it. It's okay. Um, the pre-title sequence. This I was a big fan of. The pre-title sequence uh, I predicted was going to be in Italy, which I was right on, but I had a lot of comments in my prediction videos that the flashback of Madeline was also going to be the pre-title sequence. And it turned out they put both of them in the pre-title sequence. It starts out with Madeline as a little girl, the sequence he was talking about in the train inspector. Like one day a, a man came to our house and, you know, I hit a gun. That was all shown. That's, that was what I was predicting and they, they did do all that, but it was so well done. Like all of a sudden, Safin was standing at the window with the mask and the music. It's like, it's like a horror moment. Um, that was cool. The mother, like, being completely useless and uh, uh, sitting on the couch, not even scared that a crazy man is standing in her house, shot to death within the first three minutes, like, we see her being killed by a machine gun. It's all very different. Uh, Madeline as a little girl running away, being stuck under the ice. Then we don't see what happens next until we learn later, obviously, that Safin rescued her. Um, so much there. Then the whole Italy sequence, which also was very long. Um, immediately, when uh, when Bond said, there's no hurry, I was like, oh, is he gonna say it? Is he gonna say it? We have all the time in the world. I was like, oh, yeah, that, that, that's the moment you get, yeah, yeah. That, it's just so small, and people around you don't get why that gets you a jolt, but the, the, the fan service, that to me, that was a cool moment. The Majesty's music they use, um, brilliant reference. Uh, I, I definitely am convinced a lot of fans uh, really uh, enjoyed that. Matera, all of it filmed beautifully. Uh, I was completely surprised. I did not see it coming. The bomb in Vesper's tomb suddenly exploding. It was such an emotional moment. It, it got me quiet and teary-eyed almost that he said to Vesper, I miss you. And that was powerful because he's been around since 2006. We, we know Vesper is the one for so long and to hear him say that, that was powerful. Then he, he all of a sudden the explosion comes out which really caught me off guard. I was, I was, got a jolt. Maybe some saw it coming. I did not. Um, that was, uh, that was a cool moment. Then all the action scenes, a lot of which we saw in the trailers, the, the, the part on the bike, the part in the DB5, the, the spinning around in the donut, which sadly was kind of spoiled for a large part uh, with all the trailers. Um, but it's, it's amazing. What a cool sequence. And then, at the end, you know, I was already convinced, like, Madeline's being framed. There's no way she's the bad guy now. There's no way she's working for Blofeld. So I, I told Lear, I bet she's framed. But Bond really believed it and put her on a train. They part ways and enter the title sequence. What an emotional, action-laden start. What a well way to get you invested into this movie. Props to them. I always said 
I really enjoyed the pre-title sequence to Spectre, believe it or not, um, and The Spy Who Loved Me, movies like that. But this one, this one really hits a different note. It, it, this was well done. Uh, the titles, um, there was so much there. I've only seen it once. There were, there were hourglasses, clockwork, Billy Eilish's song playing all over it. Uh, again, using flashbacks to Vesper and a lot of Bond and Madeline. Uh, DNA with the guns, that all looked superb. This this was a great title sequence, uh, well designed and no complaints for me. At least after one viewing, maybe I see it again and something pops out to me. But as of now, I enjoyed that. Uh, speaking of the rest of the story to this movie, um, it was all centered around Madeline and. I felt there were things that need that were kind of confusing. Uh, the villain's plot, for instance, I definitely need to watch that a few more times. Some parts I found really realistic, especially in this pandemic situation we're living in today. Um, you know, to, that people can spread things around and stuff. A, a, a weapon. But I was really surprised that M was the one that started the Hercules um, bioweapon uh, and it turned out to be a, a weapon of mass destruction. Very divided. As of Madeline, which is this, where it's really centered around, we've been guessing for over a year when her secret finds its way out, it will be the death of you. And I was like, how? And now the secret turns out that C was rescued by Safin in the beginning. And she has a child with Bond. That wasn't the secret. That was another secret, but that wasn't necessarily the secret. So I was still connecting dots like, okay, so the secret is Safin rescued her, yet they're enemies. You know, that's the, the, the part where I was like, how is that the end of Bond? It's, you know, that's why I need to see it more. And that's why this is just an initial review. Uh, a lot of it just needs to sink in. Um, but I did like most of the Madeline backstory. She has a child with Bond. That was another thing I was kind of predicting. I didn't want to believe it myself, but a lot of people pointed it out to me in the comments. And when I saw a review that it indeed had a lot to do with the Only Live Twice novel, uh, where Bond also has a child, that's when I was starting to think like, yeah, it might happen. And, and it did, and they, they made it well enough. There was some humor with it too, which cracked me up when Madeline told Bond, like, there's something I need to show you. And Bond went, another child? <laughs> to me, that really cracked me up. So they, they played into it well. Um, this is another one of those things. They just did so much in this story that they never did before. Bond becoming a father. Bond being killed. Felix Leiter being killed, which was another huge moment. Felix was killed. I mean, there's there's so much in this that they never did. Blofeld was killed. That's another thing they never did. Um, and they all did it in this movie, so that's what, why we just need to process a lot of this. Uh, I guess, you know, since it's just the wrap-up to um, a series of movies that stand on their own, the Craig universe, you can kill off all these characters. I guess, but still, um, yeah, it's it's a lot to take in, a lot of emotional moments, seeing Felix go, that hit me, obviously seeing Bond go, that's the big one, seeing him become a father, so a lot of emotional stuff in this movie. Um, there was also a lot of action, which I feel was all superb. Um, the opening action scenes, the, the action in Norway, uh, a lot of the cool stuff in Cuba, um, cinematography amazing, no complaints on my side from the action. It was all filmed very well, especially the, in the climax uh, where Bond was infiltrating the facility, which 
really reek back to the old Bond movies in my opinion. To see him infiltrate a facility again, kind of like a, a, the spy who loved me type of Dr. No-ish layer, a, an actual villain layer again. That's been so long in, to that extent. I mean in the previous one we had a villain layer of course, but this felt more traditional to the older ones. Um, which I really enjoyed and there was so much film work there when he was fighting on the stairs where the camera is kind of following him along uh, very modern very very well filmed I really enjoyed that it was so different to Mendes's direction so yeah that made it feel very very fresh speaking of the characters Bond Daniel Craig again superb in this role uh, he really gave it his all you can tell uh, also, you have to give him credits for his fitness. I mean, he was fit in his first outing in 2006 in Casino Royale, but he was fit in his last outing in No Time to Die too. You can't really say that to any of the Bond actors. Look at Connery's final outing, or Roger Moore's, or Brosnan's. They, they didn't go into such an extent to be in such good shape. I mean, Craig really deserves the credit for putting in the training, doing that, and, and still looking like he could do all the stuff that he does in the movie. So, Bond was amazing in this movie. Uh, Lashana Lynch is another one, a big one I want to talk about. And, you know, for me, if you've seen my prediction videos, that I wasn't a fan of what her character was intended to be, which, in my opinion, we all have an opinion, of course, is, is a political statement, to be a walking political statement, um, which I feel she, she was in a lot of ways. You know, obviously, she did get the 007 number, which... I'm, it may seem childish or immature, but to me that was a big deal and that really, I still had that one belief like maybe she is not 007, but as soon as M said where's 007 and it cuts to Bond, I knew like yeah, they did exactly what I predicting, Bond isn't 007 anymore, Lashana is, and then it was confirmed that she is, it's a minor thing, I know, but it took me a while to get over that it actually did happen. Um, I wasn't sitting in a cinema like this, but I did put in a sigh like, okay, they did do it, fine, okay, let's roll with it. And I know it sounds childish, I know. Uh, and honestly, when Lashana said permission for Bond to be reinstated as 007, it's only a number, Lyric pat patted my back like, it's okay. And again, it sounds completely childish, but it was such a relief to me. It, it, it is only a number, maybe, like they said in the movie, but to us fans, it just means 007 is Bond. He needs to be 007. Um, and I was more at peace with it for some weird reason that Lashana, that that happened, that they put that in, that they didn't keep 007 to know me until the end of the movie. Something really small, I know, but to me, very happy that it, that it was reinstated. Uh, and, and then I started to enjoy Know Me More, funnily enough, because there were so much moments in there that felt very politically forced. Like she needed to be the strong female character, sometimes at the cost of Bond, um, especially in the Jamaica sequence, uh, to put him in his place, so to speak. But they did it well, that Bond does it to her as well, and there is some fun ping-pong uh, chemistry between them. I did feel like the moment where the scientist told her, like, I can wipe out your entire ethnicity, something like that, and she got mad and got her strong moment and kicked him off. I, I was kind of eye-rolling, like, this is another one, just, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, statement I guess which I'm not saying uh, is unimportant but it feel, felt forced in my opinion um, again this is all my view maybe you think you know what are you on about but to me it felt in your face the whole time uh, that's Phoebe Waller Bridge's writing coming through in my book uh, which wasn't necessary 
But I enjoyed her more at the ending because she was brought back to the background a bit more and wasn't so in your face because there, she was constantly like, you're double O who now? You're double O again? Which number? And I'm like, give it a rest. I mean, come on, you're, you are double O seven. We get it. But why are you being pissed now? Uh, so, uh, but that was developed well that she uh, eventually matured in it and got it reinstated when she respected Bond more near the end of the movie. So that brought me at peace with it. So can't believe I'm so um, touched by a character, but it's it gets close to your dear character. Overall, she was better near the end than I was hoping for, and that's all I can wish for. Anna de Armas, on the other hand, was a traditional Bond girl, like I like to see them, and which may sound a, a bit uh, old-fashioned, but give her the cute dress. Don't make her a window dressing object. I'm not saying that. She, she kicked ass, yet she brought something new and fresh, didn't she? she she was kind of this incapable agent in a way, inexperienced I should say, not incapable. Um, which really brought a fun dynamic, like when she had to chuck down the martini and you know, you could tell like she was totally nervous and she never really had a strong drink like that before, but she just did it because she's now w working with one of the big agents. Uh, she was fun. Uh, see, they did it three times in a row now where they brought in the best Bond girls and only gave them a limited screen time. They did it with Saffron and Skyfall and with Monica Bellucci, Lucia Schiara, uh, Inspector, exactly like we predicted. They did it with Paloma, which I thought was a shame because she was another brilliant actress in this role, uh, which I can't praise enough. She was fun. Her whole sequence was cool. So, uh, well done, Anna de Armas. We also need to talk about Safin, the big villain, which I was wrong about. He wasn't Dr. No, which I didn't miss, uh, but that was one of the, I guess, the few things we weren't right about. Uh, I was waiting for the big reveal that he was Dr. No when they were in the, the big room, uh, which, by the way, was inspired by Only Live Twice's novel with the, the Garden of Death, with all the poison plants and stuff, um, which I thought was really cool. But Safin himself, the pros, he's very creepy, he, he, especially in the pre-title sequence with the mask and all that stuff, and, and he's completely lunatic, um, and he's a complete lunatic that you kind of want to see in a Bond villain, that was cool. But his plan was kind of underdeveloped in some places, or maybe not underdeveloped, maybe I just didn't get it yet on my first viewing. Um, because some of it was realistic, some of it felt very over the top, and I'm still divided on that. And, you know, in the end, you know, Bond broke his arm and just shoots him and walks off and that's it for for Safin. He's not like the major one uh, that you're gonna remember from his tenure, I think. Uh, which, I, I, he was builded up to be the biggest one yet, but I guess he, he wasn't. He was just one of the scientists working for Spectre in the end, uh, I think. Um, so, yeah, Safin. Remy Malek did give a really good performance, I gotta give him that, but is he going to be co go down as the best Bond villain? Not for me, uh, but he he can be up there. He definitely did a much better do job than uh, Dominic Green in uh, Quantum of Solace. I mean, you're gonna remember Safin. So, yeah, cool, cool villain, uh, another one to go down in history. Again, we also need to talk more about Bond becoming a father, Bond having a child. Um, how do you guys feel about this? T to me, this is another one. It's cool, it's different, it's never been done before, but, believe it or not, it's also Fleming, you know, it, it did happen in the novels. Uh, when, when Madeline said she, she's not yours, I already didn't buy it. And Bond's like, well, the, the, the blue eyes, she got the blue eyes. Which, uh, to me, that, it was just written well, funny enough. So, yeah, it was welcomed. And, and if you're going to do a conclusion, 
where everything can be wiped out in the end. You don't need to write a sequel to this where Bond still has a child or something. I guess this is the moment to go for it and just kill off characters and bring in, uh, make Bond a father and all that. So I guess it worked. Overall though, what a fun, well-filmed, well-made movie. I definitely need to check it out more. You can definitely expect a recapping episode, full treatment review, like I did with the other 24 and Never Say Never Again, uh, at some point when this releases on uh, Blu-ray. Also, when I reach my second Patreon goal, I want to release a top 25 Bond movies that also includes No Time to Die, so uh, check out my Patreon page as well for all the benefits that are located there. Uh, there is a lot uh, that I give in my two tiers, so please check that out as well. And please stay tuned, uh, keep up the no time for spoilers hashtag for all those that haven't seen the movie yet. And, uh, you know, feel free to chat with me, especially uh, if you're one of my supporters, you can reach me in the Discord server where you can chat with all the other fans about this movie. Uh, there's so much to talk about and I'm hoping to get out with much more No Time To Die related content. I want to try and collaborate with other barn channels. Obviously I want to chat with Haphazard stuff about it, but also maybe I get to chat with other barn channels. I know some of them are very open to it, so uh, there's just so much we need to get out and, and talk and discuss with others. So. Hope you enjoyed my first initial review to No Time to Die. We'll speak soon. Take care, guys.